Did you know we have a vein miner? No. Hi guys and welcome Glenmon here. In today's video we'll continue our Scarpet demonstration series first with the absolute modded classic, the vein miner, and then we'll get to really cool stuff, the holy hand grenade. Surprisingly these two things have actually quite a lot in common. As previously this is primarily a demonstration of the Scarpet programming language and how you can use it to add new tools and behaviors to the game without the need of modding the game to add these new behaviors into it. If you are not interested in the programming part and just want to use these tools and plugins, be my guest, I'll try to limit the code demonstrations to the minimum, but I want to use these videos also as a Scarpet programming tutorial, so if you want to learn how to use Scarpet for these kind of applications or want to develop something completely on your own, I'll try to explain as concise as possible on how to write such things so you can come up with some new stuff. So Scarpet is part of the Carpet mod that I'm developing and it gives the convenient ability to program these behaviors in a similar way to data packs, but in a much more powerful and very programmers friendly way. So what's hard about the vein miner? We talked about hammers last time and it seems like vein miner should be exactly something like that, just bigger and only restricted to one type of a block. Oftentimes in modded that gives us a little square type cutouts. But that would be too artificial and for a more natural looking effect you would want to add a little bit of randomness to it. Now, if you would only restrict the vein miner to ores only, and that wouldn't be a big of a deal, but if you would want to have this working on everything, we would need a much more realistic and random way of doing it for that. Also another aspect to answer is how we would require the same blocks to connect to continue with the vein mining process. Should they just touch directly or maybe... They should go through the edges or maybe just through the corners is enough. It's all up to you. I'll be allowing any connections even through the corners, but since the Scarpet program for the Veinmar is relatively simple, you should be able to change it quite easily and I'll show you how to do it. So in short, how we'll be doing it is by detecting players breaking block and would tell not only which block was broken, but ensures that the player was actually allowed to break it, meaning that we don't need to protect special blocks, etc. And for that, we'll be spreading our block breaking call for each block in the neighborhood, sending out with decreasing value, telling us where to end. Obviously checking if we are still breaking the same type of block. And each block will be treated with the same function as uh, the blocks in the center is applied to different positions and that's called recursion. And the delay between the actions will be obtaining using the schedule function. Another thing I have decided we can start doing with those tools not to interfere with vanilla mechanics is to use unusual enchantments to invoke certain behaviors. In this case, to get the vein miner working, we can have any pick, but it needs to have a sharpness enchantment on it. The higher the level, the more vein mining power we have. Now, we would not be able to put such a weird enchantment in survival nor via enchant command, but in creative, we can always apply almost anything on anything with an anvil. However, if you are playing yourself, feel free to use whatever criterion you want to determine when we want to vein mine stuff. One thing that is common for all vein miner applications is they typically require player sneaking, so we'll add that to it as well. So now let's quickly look into the code how it's implemented. This should take us a second. We'll start with our function to check specific enchantment level of a health tool, we talked about that last time, and we're just reusing it here. We also have a simple distance function call that computes Euclidean distance, so the distance in a straight line between two points, nothing special here. Then we have our callback for player breaking a block. First we ensure that the player is actually sneaking, then we check if the health tool has a specific enchantment. In general, you want to put these tests that are cheaper and more likely to fail first, but none of them are specifically expensive in this case. Here we can also check for a block if it's an OR block, for example, or if it's a block that matches the tool, etc. But here we just want to enable all wind mining for all blocks. And then we'll just call the block breaking function, indicating that the center block is already broken, since that call is actually generated right after the player successfully broke the block, so it's actually be air or liquid at this point. At each breaking location, we check if the distance to the center expired, and if so, we stop the process. Otherwise, if we need to verify and break the block, which happens everywhere except the first block, we just check if we are at the same type of block that we had in the middle. Normally, we would use a harvest function to take care of the removal of blocks, dropping its loot according to player enchantments, decrease durability, show particles, etc. But for the purpose of the demonstration, we'll just set it to air so it's a little bit less laggy. 
Then we'll look through all the neighbors of the block and repeat the same function with extra delay, so using Scarpet's schedule function that delays the execution of a call by a set amount of ticks. We want to delay it more further from the center we are, which is just to make sure that our break calls arrive from the shortest path from the center and then we decrease the TTL, in this case by a fixed value. Since we are going through the immediate neighbors of a block, there is no randomness involved. Our breaking pattern should resemble a diamond, but also we won't be able to break blocks through the corners or sides like so. To get the cuboid breaking shape, we just need to use a different function here. Let's use rect, which iterates over a rectilinear area of blocks, a cube, and we should get a cube instead. You can notice the delay, how it spreads due to the delay we choose to be dependent on how far the broken blocks break from the center, which gives a really cool effect. With the cuboid scanning function, we'll be able to go through blocks, edges and corners, but if you don't want that, just stick to the neighbor's iterator. Next, what you can do is, for example, to make the TTL decay depending on the distance, which should give us more spherical carving tool, which is pretty cool. But the best would be random, and for that we can achieve it with randomizing the TTL decay like so. So it's not constant anymore. Pretty cool. Yet still, the process itself looks really regular when blocks are broken, so we can always randomize the delay part a bit as well. And with this, both the spread of blocks and the speed will have some random components which makes the obtained hole much more irregular and nice looking. So that was the vein miner. Obviously breaking that many blocks at once makes durability in survival go really quickly, which means that it will be extremely easy to break the tools since there is no good way to stop it from happening, which I guess would be a decent trade-off for a vein miner ability. And the random shapes of the obtained holes make it actually quite realistic in case of the destruction it causes. So we have a cool way to break an area of blocks, so what if we change the block breaking into something more interesting? For example, if we follow the same path, just replace all the blocks with falling blocks equivalents. And I'm not talking just about sand, but also other blocks complete with all their block states and even block data, and give them some specific paths to follow. Unfortunately, game doesn't render falling chests models, apparently those are current limits of the game, but if that falls properly, the content should be preserved. Unlike Vein Miner, this tool actually doesn't mine any blocks per se, just converts them into falling blocks form, but if these blocks end up landing on an invalid position, they'll simply drop as items as falling blocks do. We'll also make a change so that the tool would affect all types of blocks, not just one type like we had with the Vein Miner, and for that we'll need to take care of what we are actually breaking, preserving such blocks like bedrock or air or water. Thankfully, there's only a few of them like that. Also for a change with the Vein Miner, but it's just a technicality, we'll be assigning this behavior to pickaxes with power enchantment, and this is another incompatible pickaxe enchantment, but the term power, so many meanings, magical power, electric power, sheer power, it that makes sense to use it in many applications like that. In this case, it will be like a crashing power. So let's quickly look in the code what we changed comparing to the Vein Miner. So first of all, we are using a different uh, player action, and player left clicked on a block, and down there we are checking the power enchantment on the pick, as well as we don't care if a player is sneaking or not, in this case. Here we need a new function that checks if a given block is valid for smashing, since unlike Vein Miner, we'll take the opportunity and responsibility of affecting all sorts of blocks, so we won't be touching uh, air blocks, lava, water, as well as unbreakable bedrock and all the creative blocks like barrier, command blocks, structure blocks, etc. etc. All other blocks will be mined more or less easily in survival, I may have missed one or two. The other big change is how we are handling the blocks that we are affecting instead of calling harvest. Simply we have this new section that first grabs all the block data and properties of the block in question and adds it to the following block entity we'll be spawning. And for that we need a proper JSON string of block data for tile entities like chess, etc. that holds its content. Thankfully the block data function should return a valid JSON that we can use straight away and block properties which we will build here. Here we make two extra special cases to preserve liquids, we don't want to copy waterlog block time but remove it from the block so we don't send it flying water. And for chests we just make sure to split all the joint double chests otherwise they will render incorrectly when they land on the ground. 
Thankfully, all the properties values are of simple types and passing them as quoted strings work just fine for booleans, numbers and strings. And depending on whether the block was waterlocked or not, we leave an air or water behind in that block space and just send the block flying. For that, we spawn a falling block entity in the center of a block offset a little off the ground with appropriate tank to preserve all the block features. Unfortunately, this doesn't prevent from some limitations that are vanilla, like the fact that falling chests are not simply rendering or when containers like chests break as a block, the content is not dropped but lost. But here at least attempting to preserve as much as we can. And then we change the motion of the vector of the identity with direction away of the center uh, where the player clicked, giving this kind of a scatter effect. And it will give a substantial lift to the blocks depending on the pickaxe power level, as well as the distance to the center block, which should blow all those blocks up into the sky. As an accompanying effect, we will play a dragon fireball explosion sound, which is significantly shorter and much more concise compared to normal explosion sound. So with many of them sounding at the same time, we won't be experiencing this echoey effect and display some explosion particles. Just be a little careful not to completely lag out the client uh, with them, we'll just do it from time to time. So that's the Smasher, only a tiny bit different compared to the Vein Miner, but overall a very different effect. Technically, it doesn't break any blocks, but chances are rather high that normal world things not gonna land when they should and stuff will just pop off. It's a great for demolition of things and makes a huge mess of any structures. Obviously, I'm using here power 5, the highest level, and according to that, we have put together in the program, the area of effect is pretty huge. And as I always said, this is just a plugin or a program or a carpet data pack, however you want to call it, so you can always tune it and tweak it to fit your needs and to make it work exactly how you would want it to work. You could always achieve this level of extra features implementation with modding, but you would never be able to customize it to your needs beyond what the mod author already envisioned. With, with command system, mostly because it doesn't represent a proper programming language, implementing some of the obvious operations like in this case rewriting block properties and data in a falling block entity is only possible by listing all the possible blocks and block states according to set things at least. Here, it feels a little bit choppy when you land the smash, but believe me, this is just client-side choppiness from spawning all those entities, uh, sounds and particles. Entire program of how to implement this behavior is very simple and very cheap to run, cheaper than I initially thought I could make it when I was starting with the entire Scarpet project. So we have the explosive pickaxe blowing large groups of blocks to smithereens, and if we attach this behavior to a thrown projectile, we'll get the holy hand grenade. I always thought fire chargers are underutilized, as they could only be used to light stuff on fire. It's weird that you can fire them from dispensers, but not from the hand, as typically the dispenser is the block that, in terms of the interactions, was failing behind the player capabilities. But in this case, player hands fire chargers have very little use, which I think is a little odd. In this case, we'll not only give player ability to throw out the fire charges as fireballs, but also attach a grenade-like functionality to them. And it just feels awesome, especially that, apart from the carpet programming itself, nothing here, what we see is out of what vanilla game mechanics is internally capable of, is just not accessible due to the command API restrictions. So rather obviously we will be trying to hook our custom action with fire charges to some sort of a player-triggered event, but which one is always a good question. Obviously, we would want to preserve and not interfere with vanilla behaviors. Actually, Scarpet doesn't even allow to interfere with them. But which of the Scarpet event hooks to use is another question. We would want to deploy the fire charge where a player is pointing into nothing and not, for example, when looking at a block and lighting it on fire. But to test that, we can use our trusty event test program that I showed last time that will just inform us what kind of events are being registered. Gladly we can notice that when we right click in the air, we get a player used item event, and when we light block on fire, we get a block right click by player event, which means that we only need to care of a specific action and not to trace where the player is looking at. Now there's not a problem because it's something that we can query with carpet, but we got lucky a little bit in here. Then what we need to do is to spawn the fireball, give it the proper direction and momentum and let it go, making sure that for survival like players, we should decrease their item stack count of uh, the fireballs in the hand. On top of that, to distinguish between regular fire charges and our quote-unquote modded ones will require power enchantment to be present on them, which you can apply via commands or via anvil in creative mode. And this will also indicate the power of the explosion. And then we'll need to make sure that the explosion happens when the fireball hits something. 
as an asset bonus kind of to make the whole situation a little more realistic or less realistic actually we'll be adding some extra momentum to the converted falling blocks in the original direction of the fireball does this make it more believable not really but it's, it's kind of nice to have Obviously, as before, we'll add explosion particles and sounds to that as well, although likely so, you won't be hearing anything because of the distance. So let's see how it's made. We start again with the usual stuff, nothing out of the ordinary. First, we hook up to the player used item event and then discern whether the player was holding a fire charge with power enchantment on it. And if that's all fine, we deploy the grenade. Deployment of the missile is the same as spawning uh, a bullet in front of the player. And then if the player is in survival, we'll just get a selected hand slot, grab number of fire charges that they have in the hand and decrease it by one. And we know that they hold in the main hand since that's what we have required at the beginning. Otherwise, we need to employ a deeper search for our sp special fire charges in the offhand as well. And then we just need to decrease the stack by one. To create a bullet, we start the player position, we'll add uh, its height, the Y coordinate, and then we'll add a player look vector, which always returns a vector of length one, so normalized and it's in the direction the players are looking. And we just need to spawn a fireball exactly at this position and give it some constant momentum, which will be the extension of the player look vector. This makes sure that the fireball keeps going in that direction. The power momentum of length one seems to be way too fast. It'll be more like a shotgun bullet. So we need to decrease it by a lot, in this case by five times. And this should look right. Then you need to attach the explosion code to this fireball. So that when the fireball gets removed, It'll run our explosion function and our extra arguments, so player look vector uh, to add to the extra momentum to the converted blocks, as well as the power indicating the size of the explosion, will be attached to the entity argument passed by the entity event. In our case, this function will be called when the fireball collides with something. Upon collision, we are looking at the first block that is valid for being smashed, so within our three out diamond shaped area and trigger the cascade effect from there. Because despite possibly colliding with the block, fireballs explode not in the blocks. And we need our vein miner hop from block to block like a scenario in our implementation. So we need to find a starting point for that. In this case, the explosion is the same recursive explosion we have seen with our block smasher, with one exception, which is that we are also adding a small portion of the initial direction vector to the X and Z coordinates of the spawn falling block entity, which is passed along to the bias argument for the recursive call. In practice, the holy hand grenades not only feels very satisfying, but it looks really great. Again, with that many blocks, uh, often a couple hundred at a time, leaving potentially hundreds of blocks items on the ground, the game quickly gets quite choppy, especially with me recording at the same time. But in terms of the effect wise, it's actually not that much more powerful than the TNT. So that's it guys for today. I hope you liked it, uh, learned something new about capabilities of this carpet language and as previously I'll post links to these three programs we used today in the description and to use them directly just create a scripts folder in your world, drop them there and load them with the script load command in the game, providing you're running your game on carpet mode. So let me know what else do you want to see with this carpet programming series. More creative tools to manipulate blocks like Rod of the Shifting Crust or Tree Chopper, or maybe something that relates more with the entity's control, like an item magnet or vortex enchantment from the April Fool's video, which some of you have correctly identified not as a mod, but the Scarpet program running in the background. I'm quite flexible in this regard, so please voice your opinion down in the description. As usual, if you enjoyed the video, learned something new, don't forget to leave me a like, subscribe if you're new for more such content in the future, and see you in the next one. Bye-bye.